it's just cathedral really, I don't know, it's heavy metal. It's heavy metal with loads of different influences. And then I was a promoter, I used to put on gigs in a pub down the road from here called The Hand and Heart. I used to do a lot of like European hardcore bands and American hardcore bands and stuff. I started off doing a fanzine that led me to do promoting gigs and then I got to know loads of bands and I used to hitchhike around following punk bands all around the country and stuff. Um, you know, that was my life. I really absolutely loved being a part of that scene. I thought it was like the greatest thing to be involved with, you know. I went to a Catholic school and I hated religion. And to me, that this was the next best thing to finding something that you're really into, you know. There wasn't a religion, but it kind of was in a way, I suppose. And um, yeah, so Napalm, I used to see them all the time before, before Mick joined and they were kind of a, a bit different. Uh, when Mick actually joined them, they totally transformed and turned their style around and they just got faster and faster and faster and faster. It got to the stage where every week you go and see them the Mermaid. And you'd be like, they can't get any faster. But the next week they'd actually get faster. And you'd be at the stage where it's like, they're so fast, it's pretty stupid, you know, it's kind of ridiculous. But anyway, so then, then Mick asked me to join, I joined. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. When we did the Scum album, I think I had one rehearsal before it, and we did one gig without a rehearsal. And, um, and I was promoting the gig that I did, which was the first gig that I ever did. I didn't really know what I was doing. And uh, in the studio, we had the lyrics. Jim, uh, Jim, the old bass player, wrote the lyrics. And Mick was standing at the side of me whilst I was standing in front of the microphone, and he was cueing me when to come in. <laughs> so I really didn't know what I was doing. And then, of course, like Scum, that, that was the album Scum, and that turns out to be like a, I guess, a, quite a legendary album now, after all these years, I suppose. And um, it just went from there, really. Um, you know, we did quite a lot of stuff. We were kids, we didn't know what the hell was going on. We were on TV all the time. Front cover of NME, John Peel was a massive champion of the band. So they, they, these kind of things happening were quite surreal, really. I mean, you know, when you've grown up, a kid listening to John Peel since you were 10 or 11, with like an earpiece, a a transistor earpiece. radio, <laughs> and your covers like in bed listening to the new UK Subs new session or something like that. You know, John Peel was absolutely the best teacher you never had at school, really, I suppose. Taught me everything, really. So then the next minute you're on his radio show, and it didn't kind of make sense, really. And then you're getting all this controversy. And then there's all this stuff going on, you tour in all these places. And, and it was great, but uh, it got to a stage where I just didn't enjoy it anymore. I think, it, with me personally, I, I found it to be, the fun had gone out of it. Loads of other reasons aside, I decided to leave. But during that time, I was really, like, like we were saying earlier, I was getting into the heavier, slower bands. And I was getting more and more into Sabbath and which one in general and stuff like that. And um, I had no aspirations to ever do another band again until I kind of met these guys, really. The idea for the band came into thought at least around about was it late 89 or something I think. I'd met uh, Gary previously and Griff previously but we're going to that a bit later I suppose. Um, basically one night we were in a, a gig in Cardiff, it was a carcass gig and um, my flatmate at the, t at the time used to drive carcass to, most, to, to their shows occasionally and um, so I just went down to the gig with him, went up to Liverpool, met Griff and the guys went down to Wales, got extremely drunk. And uh, it was about the second or third time I met Griff, I think. And he was doing a fanzine called Under the Oak, which was, it was mainly doom and associated bands that had some kind of sim affinity with that kind of idea and that kind of style. And I was completely blown away by that fact that someone was actually doing something like that because you, you, there's like a handful of people you knew were into that kind of music. There weren't that, that many really. And for somebody to be so dedicated to it, I thought, wow, this is brilliant. And anyway, we got, as I say, we got quite drunk, to say the least, and started talking about all our favourite bands. And I'd left um, the band I was in previous to that, Napalm Death. And we said, oh, why don't we try, why don't we get something together for the hell of it, you know, just do a demo and um, see what we can come up with. And uh, that was basically the foundations of the idea. We started that night. And then, uh, I think we both woke up the next day with extreme hangovers, saying, do you remember that conversation we had? We were like, yeah. <laughs> it's like a real great idea, but who the hell are we going to find to, uh, like, musicians that were into that kind of music that would actually be capable of, like, 
actually making like at least four people into a band, you know, because we didn't really know any other people. And then we both um, realised about Gaz because we both met him, I think, previously for the probably for the sake. I think Gaz might have bought a copy of the fanzine off you before, and you stayed in touch. I don't really yeah. know. And I, I was introduced to Gaz from. I think we, used, I think we used to write together, didn't we? The tape trading time. Yeah. Well, the first time I ever met Lee was I met him. I was in a band and we played with their nuclear assault and uh, I kind of had a sort of, I got on well with their bass player Dan Lilka, he kind of, he was a really cool guy. And, he was a uh, friend of mine as well. Yeah, and obviously he, uh, uh, I was just on the tour bus with him one day and he said to me I'll come and listen to some stuff at the back of the bus and he had the Napalm album which had just come out which was Enslavement, uh, the pre-copy I think or something and uh, I was just talking to him about music and things and that was that really and then I uh, met Lee at a gig, he introduced me to Lee and he said oh this is Gaz, uh, he's a big Sabbath fan and he likes trouble and things like that because I didn't really know anyone who was into them kind of bands, I was the only person I really knew at Lightning that stuff and I thought it was kind of cool that he was into the kind of uh, bands that I liked as well. So that was the, my first meeting with Lee and then that was 88, and 89 I went to, I think it was, was it the Grind Crusher tour? Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, yeah. and that's where I met Griff, because I think I went to see Carcass and there was Bolt Thrower playing as well, and I was walking through the foyer and uh, there was this like, long-haired guy with this fanzine, like under the oak, and I was like, wow, that's really cool, what's all this? All the bands that I'd either heard or heard of, never actually heard some of them, but I knew the names. So I got his fanzine and I eventually just started writing to him. And uh, he then mentioned that Lee had they'd met each other and they were talking about getting a band together. Would I be interested in doing something? I sort of corresponded with the two of them and uh, I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot and everything and uh, see how it goes. And, you know, like uh, what, 19 years later, I'm still sitting here talking about it, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> around for a couple of years and uh, when I was in that band um, I tried to do things which you know we did with Cathedral later on but obviously not as good but uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no and acid rain I mean, acid, <laughs> you probably got that wrong way around acid rain wasn't as good that's what I'm saying but what I'm saying is that <laughs> I tried to get the doom elements into my old band but none of the guys really in my old band were really wanted to go in that direction. I mean, kind of weird, I just, I was more into the slower stuff. It, it was more, to me, it was more important. Um, but anyway, just going on to Acid Rain, I, I kind of just left them and uh, and then just kind of quit. I had a few, few sort of personality clashes with a couple of members of the band and didn't really get on with them and just decided to uh, up sticks halfway through a tour. And That's the night I met you, was yeah, it? Yeah, was the last, last night. <laughs> You're we supposed to go to Europe yeah, then, aren't you? Yeah, wrote him a goodbye note and said... You said it. goodbye to me and left him a note. So, <laughs> and he'd gone. Yeah. Let's so, go to yeah, Europe without him. Yeah, so I just said, like, see you. Uh, don't want to be part of it anymore. <laughs> yeah. I had no desires, really, to I was supposed to be in another band, Ambitions. Didn't know really what I wanted to do. Uh, I think we were probably all like that. Yeah. I think I'd sort of done it, kind of got disillusioned, you know, disillusioned like this, with it, and uh, I don't know. I just then I obviously just got in touch with these two. Mm -hmm. um, first few rehearsals, we had a drummer called Andy Baker, and he was um, an ex-member of. The Verrucas and, and Sacrilege, which is one of my favourite bands. I think collectively we're big fans of Sacrilege. First rehearsals were kind of weird at first, though, because with them, um, I just think uh, we didn't really know each other that well. We, 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 we were quite nervous. Yeah, yeah. we didn't have, we know just had this idea of a band. We wanted to be in a doom band. We wanted to do something and we wanted to emulate the bands we were into. And it was weird. Yeah. But we didn't really, we didn't know each other's personalities and we're all like from different parts of the country. and. Real, I was really nervous coming down and stuff, and uh, I think we all were. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, we all were because we had we had the concept, but we didn't have the the way to approach yeah, it. Yeah, we didn't really know what we, were, we knew what we kind of wanted to do. We didn't know how to sort of go about it, sort of thing. And 
we got there in the end, like, you know, but uh, it was kind of strange the first ones. And then, uh, I think after well, that... Well, Griff was playing guitar. Yeah, Griff was playing guitar the first three or four years. So there was like two guitars and no bass. Yeah. And then, um, you switched to bass when Ben joined, I think. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. It must have been, yeah. Because uh, then we got a drummer called Ben Mockery. He joined for... Uh, did the not, first demo. Yeah, not, um, not for long, but... He was a good drummer for the kind of style that we did. He suited us perfectly, really. Totally, yeah. He was uh, the good, slow stuff. good for what we did and everything. So we just went and walked along for a couple of months, got some stuff together, and then we're about to do a demo. And then, lo and behold... Another Acid Rain next member joined, came along. <laughs> <laughs> I took over from Gaz uh, about, I guess about three months after he left, it was about a month and a half after Acid Rain returned from Europe. Uh, their guitar player gave me a ring and asked me if I wanted to rejoin them, so yeah, yeah, I replaced Gaz in Acid Rain. And you were, was it Lord Crucify you were in the Lord Crucify before that, yeah. Shrew. Deadline. With my... Deadline. With Deadline. Deadline before that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's another band called Deadline now, I should yeah. see. It was literally a couple of days before we recorded the demo, wasn't it? Uh, I think I've been down to rehearse for you before that, and uh, a couple of weeks before or something. What but I remember about... I about don't remember we rehearsed the, the like, night before. In the flat. You it, and you were like, oh my god, it's going to be awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it wasn't ready, it wasn't ready. It was like the same with Soul Sacrifice, writing all that stuff the day before. Yeah. We didn't have a name for the band or anything at the time, did no, we? No, what was it? Tower you of you Silence. wanted to call it Father, yeah, like I wanted to call it Tower of Silence. There's so many different Trinity was another one, I think. I remember, yeah, I remember we had all these uh, riff ideas and Gaz started coming up with more and more stuff. And then. Um, yeah, you'd stockpile them, hadn't you, with the Morbid Doom? There's a few <laughs> Morbid Doom cast offs yeah. uh, flying around. <laughs> but then. I think you met Adam at a record fair, didn't you? In Leeds? Yeah. yeah. Well, I bumped into him a few times going around pubs and Harry and so. Yeah. I think on one occasion I came back to you after now. You put some morbid yeah, down so before yeah. you actually recorded. Yeah. Before recorded. Well, I remember getting the phone call off him, he'd been around there and you came yeah. over that riff at the end of Serpent Eve or something. Yeah, well I'd written that and we talked before and yeah, we'd been fiddling around there. Well I remember you sent a cassette down of just riffs. And I was listening to it thinking, Christ, this is amazing. It was like a funeral request and Serpent Eve on this tape, just guitar. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, where's this guy come from? It's yeah. like, you know, the contrast between your style and Gaz, it was like absolutely perfect. I couldn't think, I, I, couldn't, I, didn't, I didn't know where you were coming from. It's like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? <laughs> How did he come up with these riffs and stuff? I thought he was fantastic, you know. And then when we actually got together and started writing stuff for the album, it was, like, it was great. So how did you come up with those kind of ideas uh, at uh, that time, at that period of time? Cause to be honest, they just kind of came out of nowhere. Funeral request was, I was trying to do a kind of a bit of a Black Sabbath cross with which find a general type thing, but it just came out slower. Uh, and nothing sounded like any of the two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it didn't sound like them at all. It's, it's weird how you say that now, and it's yeah. actually probably how you meant it at the time. That's how it was but like you say, it didn't sound like either of those bands. No. Because I guess what I would say, personally, what I would think is, we were kids, you, we were young, listening to extreme music and then getting into, going back with time, getting into the earlier yeah, bands that it, were yeah. the roots mm -hmm. of the whole kind of heavy stuff we were into. So you're obviously approaching it with a younger head who's still coming out of the extreme metal kind of scene. Yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd all been playing this aggressive... Uh, Acid Rain. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I still got to stand that. More <laughs> aggressive <laughs> than other stuff. Yeah. Uh, just remember Gaz coming upstairs and said, oh, how about calling it Cathedral of Doom? Lag. Uh, <laughs> lag. <laughs> I think that day we'd walked past the cathedral, yeah. the ruins, yeah. and we were both looking up at the cathedral and we were talking about it and it's like, wow, isn't that yeah. awesome, you know? And we, I remember saying to you, imagine if we want the sound to sound how that looks, the ruins of the cathedral. Big, yeah, massive, yeah. bombastic, and <coughs> impressive, kind yeah. of, that's the sound we wanted to aim for. 
And then I think we'd been down the pub, and he didn't come. He was downstairs <laughs> looking for all my records or whatever. Would he? <laughs> <laughs> he came upstairs. We were pissed. He was like. Oh yeah, yeah, like you say, it's like, yeah, I reckon we call it Cathedral of Doom, like. <laughs> <laughs> For weeks I was like, Cathedral of Doom, no, no, no. And then on a bus one day, I remember, I think we are in Birmingham or something. It's like, yeah, why don't we just call it Cathedral? And then it kind of stuck. And then, we, then it was the best name it could have possibly been, really. I really thought when the initial idea of Cathedral came up, that we, we, it was just like a bunch of mates, like, we were totally fanatical about doom metal and stuff. It was just more of a more of a novelty than anything else for us actually to get together, and, it, and the idea of recording a demo was something that was almost like a fantasy, really. It's because I grew up, you know, obliterated by cost as well. It was like I had to travel mm. from different parts of the country. And I mean, we were like, you know, like the flat I was in in Hillfields. We literally would, the train fare would crucify everybody. That was like mm -hmm. like two weeks gyro or something on one train <laughs> ticket. <laughs> Face <laughs> of the cold and, and dark. And there'd be no electricity in the flat, and we'd be scratting pennies together. Yeah, to you had take that little electric fire. That's right, yeah. So, <coughs> and we were, you know, we used to watch, we used to torture ourselves by watching like old Pants People videos <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Rising Damp episodes and Steptoe and Sun and Abigail's else party and stuff like that just to humour ourselves because we were so depressed because we didn't have any money to get wrecked. <laughs> so, we had some real, you know, we we're quite, uh, I think we we're quite a, uh, a band that had like a real quite a bleak it was bleak presentation with the way we presented ourselves but we actually had a really good laugh i think we all we we're all quite cynical people really mm -hmm. but with a real dark sense of humor so we always had a, a great laugh in those days um and i think when we when we did the forest album it was almost like a it was an endurance test really to actually make it to, to, to make it convincing i I personally felt I had to make myself feel the anxiety that was expressed in the music. And I think we were all going through like problems with relationships and stuff at the time. And as much as I, probably our ex-girlfriends wouldn't like to hear it, but it was probably <laughs> pretty grateful to them that uh, it went horribly wrong because it made well, us all express the anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Personally speaking, with Cathedral, I was more inspired by someone like Michael Jira from The Swans or Nick Blinko from Rudimentary Pino, or Diamanda Galler or Decadent Poetry. Curse, uh, uh, well, I, was, I was really into Charles Baudelaire, and, and I think Griff was really into Lovecraft and stuff. And, um, and Griff bought this amazing book, which I think um, Funeral Request was yeah, it's based around. Book of Jade, wasn't it? By uh, D.P. Barnett. It? Very it's kind of similar to Baudelaire, and it's like tripped out, uh, it's like death decad wish kind of stuff, yeah. Death imagery, romanticism. Sort of Absolutely thing. fantastic, and I think the lyrics that you took from that and used on funeral request are just perfect. They really. yeah, fitted in well with, I mean, went up to Adams to sort out the lyrics to the music. It just seemed to fit in well, didn't it? Slotted in. Yeah, I think lyrically that the first album's very quite strong. I mean, I think my favourite one that I wrote is probably Equilibrium because that summarises the way I feel in many respects today, really. We were going for something that was really quite nihilistic, really, but in a, in a kind of a positive cleansing way, in the fact that it was so kind of nihilistic that it was almost sarcastic. And through that, it was almost quite humorous in some respects, but obviously people, <laughs> I don't think people saw the humorous <laughs> side to it. And it, this is another thing, I suppose, I mean, Coming from a punk background, musicians don't tend to be as good as the heavy metal musicians because I think there's a reason for that. I think like kids who are into heavy metal are more, the music itself is more important than anything else. Whereas with the punk stuff, lyrically and ideologically, ideologically the message, wise, is, the message is more important. So, so you spend more time writing lyrics and concentrating on visuals and. And I think the punk side of things is more of a creative, artistic kind of sentiment, more so than the musical one. You know, everything was very visual with punk, and, um, and it was very important. And I think with, with um, Forest of Equilibrium artwork, we came up with a title, I think, hit in a pub next door. There was a band called Atavist, and they had an EP called Equilibrium, and we were talking about that, and we were like, oh, that's a good idea to call a song or call the album that. And um, 
And then you said something like, oh, I can't remember, it was me and you were talking, and then we came up with the idea of forest of equilibrium, and that just put a, a vision in my head. And um, this vision was relayed to Dave, was it? Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> well, there's an art gallery, there's a kind of a gallery up the road. And, um, oh, and uh, it's, it's crap, really. It's generally, like local artists doing shitty religious pictures or landscapes of Herschel Common or something. And it's generally crap. <laughs> But I remember walking past there one day, and we had the idea for the for the artwork, and um, but I couldn't think of anyone to do it. I couldn't think of anyone to do it. In the old days, we used to do cut and paste stuff, and make our own sleeves, I suppose. And then you know, hurl it down the photocopiers. That's right. Yeah. And I, I still prefer that to most stuff that's done now, like Photoshop crap. But anyway, went past this gallery and saw some artwork in the, some paintings in the in the window. I was like, oh, it really caught my eye. So yeah, I went into the gallery, left a message in the notebook that was there for local artists, where you leave your comments on local artists' work, shall we say. And then I left a message saying um, to Dave Patchett, really like your stuff. It's like nothing I've ever really seen before. If we're looking for someone to design a record sleeve, would you be interested? Um, and then, quite ironically, about a day later, I got a letter from him put through the door and I found out he lived in the council block, which was directly opposite mine, pretty much. It was like a minute walk away. And I thought, oh, well, that's cool. And um, he said, if you want to come round to discuss it, please feel free to. So I went round and, um, you know, hit it off with Dave quite straight away, really. I mean, he, to this day, he does all of our album covers. He's done like eight for us, you know. He's done every album sleeve we've ever, for every record we've recorded. Um, and I think it's a very important part of what we do, really. Um, and uh, he, he like me, is very much like against anything to do with the church and religion. He's very much despises religion in many respects, and he's a very intelligent guy. And um, literally, we yeah sat down and had a few cups of coffee, went through these ideas, and about three days later, he came back knocking on my door, and he had like a I, I've actually got it with me. And, he did a pencil drawing of the album cover and it totally blew my mind. I was like, wow, this is it, it's perfect. Well, I've got the original painting at home, but obviously it's a bit heavy to bring down, so... Oops, I need to be careful with these, really I, I had a vision in my mind of like there being a central figure. And I had a very, very good idea, which Lee thought of, that we'd have a dark side and a light side. And uh, in the dark side there would be danger and it would be a little bit seedy and uh, very dangerous. You, you wouldn't, you'd have to be very strong in order to feel as if you could walk on this side without, without getting molested in some horrible way. And on the light side uh, everything is uh, safe and uh, maybe there's an element of pretense but uh, People are at least uh, are very polite, and it's uh, anybody can stroll through the light side, and uh, they never. Be, and you can organise your life to be on the light side if you want to, and uh, yes. never take a risk. And just go along with uh, what uh, people around you advise you to do, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, Lee wanted someone who could walk on the dark side on the light side, like a hero figure that is asexual, neither man nor woman, so that. Uh, they can walk on both sides of sexuality as well as on the dark and on the light. So we have a hero figure, neither man nor woman, and this figure is equally at home and looks equally confident and uh, is strolling through the dark side as if it was the light side. And vice versa, going through the light side like it's yeah. the dark, like stressed out. So it's all about balance and stuff. And in a nutshell, it's about living life without religion and finding you know, balance in, in life between like positives and negatives and yeah. light and dark. Finding strength in yourself. Yeah, that's essentially what it's about really. It's kind of a nice mm. anarchist idea. The first gig was at a place called The Stoker, which is no longer there. It's down the road from here. And that was with SOB, who were like a Japanese hardcore punk band who were on my label. Um, and then, can't remember the second. We played at the Barrel Organ, didn't we? 
We did the barrel organ, yeah, and that was funny because I remember the oh, yeah, I remember, I remember the gig at the barrel organ, and the, the Mick guys and Barney, from Mick and Barney from yeah. Napalm were there. And I remember we finished the set, and it went quiet, <laughs> and there was this. Oh, no siege in there. <laughs> <laughs> it was either Mick or Barney. Someone said, "No siege in there." And I was like, "Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you, well, you're fucking absolutely right there, because there was no siege in there." But um, and then they went away to Europe and came back, and that was the time when we played with St. Vitus for the first yeah. time in, at the Dome in Tufnell Park. Yeah, Agnostic in London with Agnostic yeah. Front. Agnostic yeah. Front yeah. Vi it was Agnostic Front, St. Vitus, Cathedral SOB, and. I can't remember who else. Mm. And then we did those like five or six dates in the UK with St. Vitus, Vitus. Which was kind of fantastic but weird. Yeah, it's like beating your idols, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember we met Wino, he, he introduced himself. He's like, Hi, I'm Wino. I was like, Yeah, I know. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think that phased him out of it. But. And then with the first tour outside of England we did was with uh, Paradise Lost. We used to get uh, people in the crowd shout, well, the, cr the crowd, Faster. the ten. Yeah. Faster. Yeah. Faster. Yeah. Yeah. Faster. Yeah. Yeah. The first major one we did was probably the Gods of Grind tour, but after the Soul Sacrifice EP. Yeah. And that's when... Yeah. Well, that was enjoyable, that. It was a good crack. That was. Yeah. The first couple of tours we did, the one in America was good as well. I always remember the God's a Grind tour because I was carrying the guitar around in one of your sleeping bags. One of mine? Because I didn't have a case for yeah, it. It was that weird fort. shaped white oh, one yeah. and I couldn't find any cases that had fit it so I had to like, carry your green sleeping bag around with a guitar. And oh, and where is it now? What, Mike? <laughs> my sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh. sleeping bag. I think the guys of Grime one was, we were getting really wrecked in those days. We were drinking a hell of a lot, smoking loads of pot. Yeah, we were. <laughs> Don't, not, no way do I go to that excess anymore, but in those early days, we were getting pretty caned. The other bands on the tour were quite scared of us, I think. <laughs> after 10 days of free beer, you start to lose your mind, really, but after that I'm stage. The only thing we were doing different in our live performances was, in the early days was the fact that we didn't have enough songs. <laughs> so, so what we used to do, we, there's, a, there's a, a female artist called Diamanda Galat, and uh, we used to play one of her tracks off the Litanies of Satan album as an intro, and we'd come on stage and just stand there for like, for like 15 minutes with her screaming her head off and just stand there like looking at the floor. <laughs> Do you uh, always remember the voice in the crowd and fuck the intro? Fuck the intro. Eugene, <laughs> <laughs> not Holland or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to hide by the back of the amps <laughs> quite a lot. I think it was just like, put your head down and just play Doom. It was important to us to do it that, that, that pace, really, I think. Um, because, like I say, we weren't the most blessed musicians. Um, so we were kind of semi-limited in what we could do. We, like Adam was saying before, we could, we could never have played like Trouble played on their first album. We, 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 could, we weren't capable of doing that kind of stuff. So we just went with what our abilities were. And, uh, well, it's kind of weird, because obviously coming out of the bands that we come out of, like, um, I suppose Acid Rain, was, some of it was semi-technical. So to come out of playing fast and having like 20 riffs as opposed to what Cathedral was doing was like four or five in a song was kind of strange. But we just, I just, you know, we just, the slowness was, was just vitally important to us to, to be as, I don't think we were like looking to be unique. We just ended up, I'm not saying we are unique, we just ended up being that way because it was just important that we were just slow. We, and it wasn't pre sort of like, yeah, because Lee was in Napalm and he's like, 
he's hyper fast, we're gonna go like hyper slow, you know, to suddenly like be slow and everything. Was it was not planned like that. Control. It was it wasn't like that at all. People mm, yeah. uh, seem to think it was like that. Seem to think but it was nothing. What they don't like realise is the natural evolution with us individually. Of course. Shit, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because obviously we just all into slow music, it it just we just wanted to be in a band that played slow stuff. And uh, I think there's something uniquely powerful about slow stuff. Of course, yeah. It's quite a magical uh, sound. There's something about it, and there's so much space for expression when you play slow. Totally. And there's something, it, because it's not like a normal tempo, because it's not like rotation of wheels and it's not like, it's kind of wrong. It's kind of wrong the way slow music is really. It's Live TV for. <laughs> The fact that it's kind of not right, <coughs> it's not played in some kind of natural way, in the natural tempo, it's kind of forced deliberately to be a different tempo than what is considered to be, uh, I don't know what the word is, just conventional or whatever. There's something about it that fucks <laughs> <laughs> Who's, what's that say? Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when we did the first demo, the, the, the songs on there were like 10 minutes long and like they, they, the band would do like... We'll be into like, we'll be into about 8 minutes. Eight minutes in, it's and like, no, go, stop, slow it, slow it, slow it. The voice from the control room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too fast, <laughs> <laughs> you sped up. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, nightmare, nightmare. The sound, the kind of sound that we had, um, there was a glut of bands that were similar sounds after what we'd done a couple of years later, or maybe in a year later or something like that. So there wasn't really anything, any band sounded like us until obviously we came about and then there sort of a few bands afterwards. So I think we did have a, a, a quite a widespread influence on a lot of uh, the type of slower bands that, you know, afterwards and everything. So I, I do think we've, uh, you know, I mean, the thing is, when, when, when we started doing it, we weren't at all pretending to think we are any, in any way original. No. I think what we, what we did, we were like paying tribute to the bands that we were, really were into, you know. And like every interview, we'd always mention The Obsessed, St. Bias, Trouble, Candle Mass. We'd always mention these groups that had influenced us because we were almost doing it as a, as a fandom thing. We were just like, you know, this is our little tribute to those groups, really. We didn't consider that it would, it would have carried on. Yeah. And um, you know when we what, like playing with St. Vitus and stuff like that, and then meeting Wino, and then meeting what well, I eventually met Bobby Liebling and people like that, and then t doing gigs with Trouble. I mean, these are bands you kind of thought you're never ever going to see, let alone actually meet the guys and and be kind of friends with them and stuff. So to us, that was what it was all about in the first place. It was, it was out of a love of the music, really, nothing else whatsoever. We didn't think we were doing anything original at all really. In fact, I think we thought we were probably quite shit <laughs> <laughs> in some respects at first because we weren't as good musicians and we weren't as good as those bands that were our, our heroes in a way. Basically, when we did the demo, um, I sent one to Earache, I sent one to Roadrunner, and I sent one to somebody else, so it might have been Century Media or something like that, I can't remember who else it was. It might have been Peaceful, I can't remember. I know Amy was really into us from Peaceful, and he wanted to sign us. And it was only when, I mean, you know, Roadrunner didn't get back to me until probably about six months after that, when I, I think things were happening in America. I think people in the industry had caught wind about Cathedral and there was a buzz about us or something like this before we'd done an album. And um It was Kevin Sharp as well, wasn't it? Kevin Sharp did the CMJ piece and um and that got a lot of people interested. And it was only it, it's only when that happened that Roadrunner started getting back and but then, then they started phoning me every day and then my phone got cut off. And I used to have to go to the library and send them a fax saying, This is the Pay, this is the phone box I'm going to be in in five minutes' time, so give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> give me a call from New York and I'll, I'll be there in the library <laughs> answering your call. It was that bad. But, um, 
and basically, but Dig at Earache was the one that went totally over the top about the band. He thought he said it was the most radical thing he'd heard in a few years or whatever. He just I don't know if that was him just saying that. He just said he really liked it, and everyone in the office liked it, and they'd love to work with us. You know, I, I think it, it just it was the best option for us at the time. They were enthusiastic about us. They were in that direction and more so than anybody else, and. And um, it, in a way, it's better the devil you know in, in many respects. And um, I think Eric looked pretty good to Cathedral as it goes. <laughs> oh. After that, obviously, we, uh, there was the five of us, with obviously the four here and, and Ben, our drummer. But uh, just prior to actually going into doing the album, <clears throat> Ben, he kind of quit and. Uh, so we got, uh, we um, didn't really know what to do about drummer, but there was a guy that we liked who lived in America, a bit of a long shot, but this guy called Mike Smell, who was in a band called Dream Death. Mike had reformed Dream Death in, under a new name called Penance, yeah. and they were one of the bands, the demo came out, and it was great, fucking had this band are back, and it's, it sounds really good, and we liked his style of drumming, and we couldn't think of anyone in England, and we wanted someone who knew what Doom was about, really, mm. and he obviously did. And, um, so he flew him over to rehearse with us and asked him if he'd do it, and he said, yeah. And he's from Pittsburgh, Pitts by the way. Yeah, yeah. Came over and rehearsed for about two or three weeks, and then went and recorded the album. And well, I can't remember what month it was now, June, was it, 91 or something? So that's basically what happened there, was Mike on the drums and stuff. And then, well, me and Gaz came mm. back to Coventry. The electricity was cut off in the flat. <laughs> There's no food, fuck all. It was free. <laughs> fucking freezing <laughs> cold. No lights or anything. And a battery. Uh, and we had a, yeah, we had a tape player. The batteries in it. And the batteries were dead. So we were listening to the tape of the album on the fucking wrong speed. <laughs> <laughs> we were coming back from the studio, really excited to hear it on the ghetto blaster, but the, the batteries were dead. There was no electricity. <laughs> Does it sound good though? It sounded bad. It sounded bad. <laughs> Especially the uh, monks at the end, monks, so oh, believe. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think we got a, we don't think we got a bad review, did we? Hmm. I think we were really surprised. I, I think it was taken very well at the time. Um, if I remember uh, rightly, it went straight to the top of the indie chart, didn't it? It did, yeah. There's always Walter Trout band just holding us up. <laughs> Walter Trout. <laughs> In what magazine was that? It's a uh, real ale. Wasn't it? Pub rock band. What was it? I don't remember. Real ale. Pub rock. Who fans in a suit? What are you on about? <laughs> was it the Walter Trout band, really? Walter Trout band, yeah. Uh, How times have changed. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, it, we were really quite surprised by the way it was received. It was received very well. videos after that but I still think that's the best one really. It only costs like a grand or 800 quid or something and we've done videos later that cost like 20 grand or something really oh. stupid. Mm. But well Columbia were paying for those and it was like... The Is that the flying carpet one? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Why it was a green blue screen. Thing. You had to hire a, a baker in as well, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <The chef. laughs> oh, you well, exactly, this is what I'm saying. Those cheesy videos we did later, there was a reason for doing the Midnight Mountain video, and that was we didn't like the situation we were in. It was almost like a fuck off to the record company. I've got, I've got a script for that somewhere. <laughs> well, script? That's that's a script? Midnight, yeah, was it, I don't know, Midnight Mountain script somewhere. Yeah, that's script. <laughs> But anyway, going back to the point, <laughs> Ebony Tears video is better than any of those and it only cost a grand. Uh, I think we were just more focused on what we were doing then. Russell's in it as well. 
Well, Russell and Nikki, my girlfriend. I can just remember these hands. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's Russell and uh, Nikki. Their hands joining you, together. You just wanted to break that union. I was like, <laughs> 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 How dare you be in love? <laughs> Remember his close up of hairy chins? <laughs> Lots of close up of hairy chin. <laughs> and it wasn't blue screen, but we put all those effects on it. Uh, mm. My best bit of that video is when you throw the soil at the, uh, oh, yeah, at the angel going. on the gravestone. Yeah. Where, was, where, we, where did we shoot that? On the road at Lon London Road Central. Yeah, well, the, the studio part, where was that done? I can't remember where that was done. Depot. Where? The depot. Was it? Quite a Belgrade theatre. Oh, right, okay. I can remember it was. Uh, Doom will be doomed. Don't, don't form a band. <laughs>